Yes. This is only the beginning. Yes. After a thousand years, Korriban is ours again. Welcome home. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is all about the Sith species, the race that would inspire and become eponymous with the Dark Side followers of the Force. This will cover over 100,000 years of history, looking into their biology, society, and culture, as well as their most influential members of their species. But first, let's thank this video's sponsor, Audible. Now, I've been saying this on live streams forever, you need to experience the Darth Bane trilogy in audiobook format. The quality of the narration, the subtle sound effects and music in the background all helps to really bring you in. Just take a listen for yourself. The last few rays of light still hung in the air when he finally reached his destination. The Valley of the Dark Lords lay sprawled out before him, hidden beneath the cover of Twilight's gloom. He briefly considered stopping for the night and making camp until dawn, then rejected the idea. Day or night would make no difference once he was inside the tombs. And that quality is true for countless Star Wars titles here, but also tons of other fandoms like Mass Effect and Halo. You can access Audible through your computer or through the app on your phone. I use the app as it's perfect for doing things around the house, driving with its streamlined drive mode, and I actually often go to sleep listening to stories of the old Sith Lords, with the sleep timer feature making sure you don't get too far ahead in the book. Oh, well, the bookmark button allows you to keep your place and even add notes. For example, here are some of the notes from Thrawn for an upcoming video. Which by the way, Thrawn Ascendancy just dropped this week, adding to the canon Thrawn trilogy and the old Legends trilogy which are all on Audible. Pick up a free copy of any of these books with your 30 day trial. Just head to audible.com slash metanerds or text metanerds to 500-500. Stay a member and you can pick from different plans getting at least one credit per month, which you can use to pick up any title you want. You can always purchase more at a discounted price, or check out tons of the free titles that are included with your membership or things like podcasts. Any title that you pick up with your credits are yours to keep forever even if you cancel your membership. Credits do roll over and you can keep them if you don't use them, and you can also download titles so that you can use them when you go offline. It's a no-brainer if you're watching a video like this and you're this big a fan of the lore. Again, that's audible.com slash metanerds or text metanerds to 500-500. Let's head back to the Sith species. We'll start by heading to their homeworld of Korriban, located at grid coordinates R5 within the Stygian caldera of the Outer Rim territories. The species would evolve on one of the most dangerous worlds in the galaxy, one that had a natural affinity for the dark side, a planet covered in mostly deserts, canyons, and mountains, though there were a few swampy regions. And this terrain was covered in horrifying beasts like the Shyrax, Kalor Slugs, and Tarentatex. One of the many mysterious ways in which the Force functions is that certain species and locations have stronger connections to the light or dark side of the Force. And the Sith species had an unparalleled natural connection to the dark side. Think about how few beings from any given species had a notable Force connection. Even those like the Togruta, who had a higher connection to the light side than most species, still only had a tiny percentage of people overall with a connection strong enough to be contacted by the Jedi. Every member of the Sith species had a powerful connection to the dark side of the Force. And because their homeworld itself was a dark side nexus, there was this feedback loop and amplifying effect where the Sith made the dark side stronger by diving deeper and deeper into its abilities, making themselves, but also the dark side itself, also stronger. This is also true for those terrifying creatures mentioned. And although they would get their nourishment from both plants and animals, they could literally feed off of the dark side as well. Its energy is providing them with sustenance to survive long periods without physical nourishment, and drawing some Sith to strive to live purely off of this dark side energy, in which they could truly say they were the physical embodiment of darkness. As for their physical characteristics, their skin color was almost always red, though some could range to this lightish pink to dark black, with the general rule being that their skin color was lighter at birth and grew darker over time, while their eye color could range from orange, red, yellow, white, or black. At multiple spots in their body, they would have these bone spurs that stick out through the skin, while their faces have these tendrils hanging from their cheeks. There were also the stalks over the eyebrows and the sides of the face, while each of these tendrils had a role in nonverbal communication, with twitches or quivering conveying anger, lifting them could be doubt or questioning, and curling showed that one was relaxed. Almost all had three digit hands, and one acting like a thumb, though some individuals had five fingers, and nearly all of them were left hand dominant. 
Even before the year 100,000 BBY, they had already developed a complex culture around alchemy, rituals, and war. Though the concept of war was probably a strange one to the Sith, they wouldn't have considered it a separate thing. They believed that existence meant to be engaged with violent conflict with one's neighbors. Tribes would slay each other endlessly and make sacrifices of living beings to their gods, the supernatural beings that they could identify in the dark side. Each of these tribes were referred to as circles, and each was led by at least one Sith sorcerer, who used the energies riled up by the combat and sacrifices to perfect alchemy and their magics. The sort of which that would be lost to the Sith of the late Republic era, only being glimpsed in the odd rituals done by Sidious, and was something more similar to that of the Night Sisters. This allowed them to create talismans imbued with dark powers, which could do anything from increased one's connection to the Force, turn a light sider to the dark side, provide biological repairs, or shield one from force attacks. These were most often used during rituals, but there were everything from tomes to manuscripts to pass on the rituals, which were themselves imbued with this magic, as well as the weapons and armor that they used. The actual armor itself was channeling the dark side, while things like powerful Sith swords, cortosis weave vibroblades called Sith Tremor swords, and the Sith War swords which combine the physical damage with various magical effects, like inducing anger or madness, but most often nightmarish hallucinations. There were also a myriad of poisons that these alchemists would produce, and ranged weapons like the Lanvarok, which combined a lot of these technologies into one, being a polearm and disc launcher combo, these discs that were covered in these dark side spawn poisons. Though the most disturbing were the creatures genetically engineered through force manipulation to create terrors like the Tukata, also known as Sith Hounds that would often guard the tombs of the Lords. There was also the Siluth, which was a war beast that would be sent into enemy fortifications, spewing acid and ripping apart victims, and then various forms of chrysalide beasts, which would usually be in the form of a modified Rancor. And technically, even the Sith temples, tombs, and many other structures are considered to be architectural, but also alchemical works. Pieces of technology that channel dark side energy through the architecture. This would take forms as varied as the pyramidal structures on Korriban to the Sith meditation spheres, and both the materials and layout were guided by the Force itself which, like their own biology that worked to feed off and amplify the dark side, these structures would act in the same way. And of course, this led them to realize that one could use these same principles of weapons and structures to make super weapons the size of buildings. Whether it be temples that can unleash enormous amounts of energy, or ships that can make a star go supernova. Now all these power struggles between the tribal circles over Korriban did eventually consolidate into larger and larger circles, and then a strict caste system within each. And over the years, they develop physical differences to the point that many consider each caste to be its own subspecies. The highest ranking were the Kisai, the priest caste that would lead their followers in the Sith magics and alchemy. They had these elongated tendrils on the face, and a slightly longer lifespan than the other castes at around 60 years. This was followed by the Zuguruk, the engineers that actually constructed the burial mounds, temples, weaponry, and later starships. The Zuguruk are where we see the most variations with the five fingers and darker skin color. Then there was the warrior class, the Masasi. They varied the most, with more tendrils covering the body, being on average a whole meter taller than the priestly class, having completely yellow eyes, and being overall more beast-like in general. They were much less intelligent than the higher castes, but of course much stronger, and would make up the bulk of the armies of the Sith both on world and as they expanded out through the stars. It is unclear when the Sith first became a spacefaring race, but they did achieve this independently, not basing their tech off of some other advanced alien visitor. Once they found other worlds, they were quick to conquer them and add a new lower level to their castes, now having an abundance of slaves. The word for them was an insult, Grothu, and most of the slaves would be from the Herglik, Mercy, and human species. Though some were Sith that fell into this role as well. These were hated more than the alien slaves, being pathetic insults to the dark side. Through their weakness, they revered the Sith Lords as gods, and all these slaves would be used to construct the ever-growing tomb complexes and fleets. And when a Sith Lord died, all of their slaves would be buried alive with them on Korriban. With the Sith now growing their first small empire in the Outer Rim, they would come into contact with the Anzadi species. These people were the closest thing to vampires, living extremely long lives and drawing blood from their victims, and they and the Sith species had a mutual respect for each other giving the Sith the Blood Soup, a concoction whose ingredients are still not fully known, but presumably must have rejuvenated the drinker or given them a deeper connection to the Force. 
By the year 36,453 BBY, the Thoyor, the pyramidal ships that were sent out by the Force to collect Force-sensitive individuals from around the galaxy and bring them to Tython, landed on Korriban to transport some members of the Sith species. These Force wielders from various species would form the Jedi Order, which eventually became the Jedi Order. Meanwhile, back on Korriban, the Sith were experiencing the most intense fighting of their history, the tribes all fighting each other for thousands of years until it was ultimately brought under a single ruler. King Addis would wield his powerful war axe, but most of his kills were earned through his incredible use of Sith magic. He would unify all of Korriban, forcing all the castes to worship him as a god, and eventually take the title of Sithari, or Perfect Being, the divine dark side made incarnate. His unholiness would rule for 300 years as the absolute ruler of all Sith, until these people saw their first real challengers in the form of the Rakata. Their infinite empire was the greatest the galaxy had ever seen, and one which also ran off a of dark side energy. Posing as dark side allies, they would teach the Sith several new technologies like the hyperdrive, but also the holocron, the Sith holocron becoming a crucial method for transferring dark side wisdom over the eons. After the Rakata had worked their way into the Sith Lords inner circle, they launched their invasion, taking Rasper, the court magician, captive, and neutralized him by isolating his consciousness in a Rakatan mind trap. While the technologically superior forces spread over Korriban, Addis would take up his battle axe and lead the charge to defend the Sith homeworld. The battle would see Rakatan machines destroyed by talismanic weaponry, Sith spawn beasts, and dark side magic, delivering a shocking defeat to the Infinite Empire chasing them off-world, and forcing them to abandon some of their crafts. With these hyperdrives, the Sith could finally expand their empire. But King Addis would die in the capturing of these ships, though this battle did help to secure the future of his people. As soon as the King died, the Sith reverted to the fractured tribal warfare, all hoping to become the next tyrant, forcing some Sith to decide to take these alien craft and colonize the galaxy, quickly establishing a settlement on Zyost. The priestly Kisai class would leave Korriban as the fighting grew out of control, with warriors all declaring themselves the new Sith Lord, and prophecies of a new Sithari that was destined to return and unify them spreading throughout the people. Even more turmoil broke out amongst the priests, with some seeing the death of Adis and the actions of the dark side wielding Rakatans as proof that this way of connecting with the Force was impure. They would focus on a new concept of unity, the mix of that other mysterious and strange side of the Force known as the Light Side. They pondered if they had been wrong in focusing on and amplifying the Dark. The musings of these priests would mark the first recorded written history of the Sith species, though these priests would be exiled from their caste and forced out to the planet Tund. Over the centuries, Zyos would become the new capital of the Sith Empire, with Korriban inhabitants killing themselves off in such numbers that they eventually settled into the role of caretakers for the tomb complexes. While the most prominent Sith were now on Zyost, they would all return to Korriban for important rituals and to be buried in the ever-expanding Valley of Sith Lords. The Empire would continue to conquer even more worlds, and by 14,000 BBY, they would set up the Sith Library Temple on Krasis II. This was similar to the Jedi Library on Ossus, but here they would further delve into the Dark Arts and experimentation on more Sith spawns and alchemical devices. About six millennia later, in 8000 BBY, a group of Republic citizens would make it into Sith space for the first time. But because hyperspace navigation was so difficult, they never encountered the growing empire of this area. Another thousand years would pass, bringing us to the reign of Dathga Grosh. He rose to power, claiming to be the new Sith Overlord, and would rule two-thirds of Korriban for over 50 years, a time which the Sith species remembered as one of the most brutal in their entire history, with Grosh's sadism and terror hitting peaks that shocked even this dark side species. At the same time, there was growing turmoil within the Jedi Order over in Republic space. Many of their force wielders were noticing that there was a wide array of useful abilities that were being ignored, and as the Jedi tried to look into them further, their masters tried to suppress knowledge, and even shame those who took an interest. Eventually, these Jedi would try to shake off their oppressive masters. They were deemed Dark Jedi by those that forced them into exile. This resulted in a civil war known as the Second Great Schism conflict that would set the tone for the rest of galactic history, as over the next thousands of years there would be countless trillions of individuals from each and every species that would be dragged into the never-ending civil war between force wielders. And this particular war would last for over a century, 
More and more Jedi were turning to the dark, but the Orthodox Jedi were still more numerous and eventually forced to surrender at the Battle of Corbos. The Jedi would not execute these prisoners, but also could not let them run amok in the Republic. They decided on exile, packing all of the dark Jedi into a drone ship that contained no weaponry and no navigation, and then firing them off into the most obscure part of the Outer Rim. No civilization had ever been recorded in this area of space. No means for these fallen ones to grow their power. Hopefully they'd be too busy trying to survive in such a sparse, inhospitable region to keep playing with their dark arts. But of course, as the Force would have it, this ship was on a course for the nexus of the dark side itself. Of all the trajectories it could have taken, it glided right into the orbit of Korriban, and then guided right down to the surface on the home of the Sith. When the Dark Jedi emerged, they were stunned to sense a connection to the dark side within each member of the species they met. Having been taught that Force connection was incredibly rare, and that the dark side was unnatural and to be shunned, the locals greeted them with violence and displays of powerful Sith magics, creating crude illusions that these trained lifelong Jedi were able to work their way through. But recognized that these techniques were incredibly different from the way they were trained by light side wielders who had only been dabbling in darkness. Lightsabers and Sith weaponry would clash, and they remembered the lessons of the Rakatan Alliance 10,000 years earlier, denying all attempts at sharing technology and methods, waging a total war on these aliens, only to be outsmarted and increasingly brought under the heel of these Dark Jedi. Even when defeated, the Sith were adamant not to give up their rituals and talismans, but eventually, through their own force manipulation and using the Sith to betray each other, they were able to break enough sorcerers to learn how to wield the dark side like a true Sith. The Shadow Hand, the second in command to Kreen Grosh's descendant, and the reigning king, came to see that these Gen Jedi, as the Sith called them, were not going to be stopped. He betrayed his king, and helped Dark Jedi Ajuntapal to secure the battle in which the Sith who sat on the ancestral throne of King Addis the Sathari would be beheaded and replaced by a human off-worlder, who now took the title the Dark Lord of the Sith. With innumerable generations raised within the strict caste system, the Sith were quick to fall in line and eventually worship Ajunta Paul as the Sith Lord. He would expand the alchemical and magical abilities, and was sure to bring the rest of the Sith Empire under his rule. He too would have Xyost as the capital of his empire, and Korriban as the mystical center. The Dark Jedi would use their knowledge of the galaxy at large to expand their fleets and conventional weaponry, while taking the creation of structures and Sith spawn beasts to new heights. The Dark Lord focused on growing an army with the Masasi Sith as foot soldiers, wielding the most advanced form of alchemical and technological weaponry. But some of the Dark Jedi were itching to strike back at the Republic that had sent them off to die. They were able to figure out a path back to Republic space, and launched a raid on the Jedi with hopes of using their new arsenal of dark powers to take over the known galaxy. This mission was not approved of by their Lord, and it was seen as a foolish, premature reveal of their forces. All it accomplished was to tip the Jedi off to the existence of the Sith, but their enemy could not tell from where the Sith came, only that this old wound was festering somewhere in the Outer Rim. Back in Sith space, the Dark Jedi had made a discovery that would change the species forever. Starting with the Masasi class, they experimented by using alchemical means to create offspring that were a mix of their human blood and Sith blood. It worked, and created a being that was more calm, intelligent, and calculated, but still with the intense direct biological connection to the dark side. This was expanded to the priestly Kisai class, and over the next 2,000 years, these hybrids completely replaced the upper castes, and then most of the Sith population. Over this time, the Sith Empire was expanding as well, taking hundreds of worlds, including Droman Kos, Kardelba, Relg, and coming into contact with Tund reconnecting with the pure-blooded Sith that were exiled here ages earlier, and then they also established a greater presence on Malachor V. But as is the nature of the Dark Side and those attracted to it, the local leaders were constantly undermining each other for any advantage, resulting in countless civil wars to try and overthrow the reigning Sith Lord. This helped to stop the spread of the Empire overall, as there was already plenty of wealth and planets to fight over. But this turmoil helped to create a string of the most powerful lords to ever live, starting in 5100 BBY with Mark Ragnos. He defeated a rival Sith Lord named Simus, and would usher in what was referred to as the Golden Age of the Sith. Over a hundred years of unprecedented stability and growth. He was a half-breed Sith who was able to pit all of the rivals against each other, but two stood out. The Sith Lord Ludo Kresh and his rival Naga Sadao. 
Kresh wanted to simply consolidate power in Sith space and delve deeper into the mysteries of the dark side, while Sadal felt that it was time to take war to the Republic. Naga Sadal was actually proud to claim that he was mostly of, quote, Jedi blood, and he saw this golden age as one of dull stagnation. At the funeral for Marka Ragnos, these two contestants to the title of Sith Lord would call in their armies and fight to the death, but neither could defeat their enemy. At a break in the fighting, the spirit of Ragnos rose up from the tomb to speak to the Sith, laying out their long history and his aims with the Golden Age, but ended by saying that the future of the Sith was in their hands, that they must choose wisely between isolation and expansion. This decision could forever change the Sith. Just as the spirit faded back into the tomb, they spotted a craft descending through the clouds. It was a ship containing a pair of explorers that set out from Republic space and the two humans were quickly thrown in restraints and hauled off to the prison on Ziost. Nagasadao knew this was his chance to expand, while his rival Kresh and the entire Shadow Council all agreed that the Republic explorers should be executed. Sadao was secretly orchestrating their escape and framed a murder on their exit, making the whole thing look like a Republic strike team rescue mission. The Council was convinced and backed the bellicose Sadao who was eager to get revenge on the invaders. Kresh sensed trickery, and though he was able to split the Sith for a time, Sadal was able to defeat his forces and unify the people. All the while, his human pawns made their way back to Coruscant via a ship containing a tracking device. The invasion would be launched via the Daragon Trail, moving all their forces at once and setting up a forward base in the system of Primus Golu. An area controlled by Empress Teta was assaulted to test one of Naga Sadal's strategies. He knew the Republic military numbers were far greater than the Sith fleet, but through sorcery they were able to maintain large-scale illusions of Sith craft, working to crush morale, cutting off escapes and forcing surrenders, and guiding the battles to take place where the Sith generals wanted, these illusions providing much of the advantage of superior numbers without needing to fire a shot or even engage the enemy. With this strategy, they would press on to take the crucial Republic shipyards at Forost, and then on to Coruscant itself. Sith Lord Shar Dakan would lead the push up to the steps of the Senate Hall, but Sadao's meditation sphere would be discovered and fired upon. Breaking his connection, these illusions generated via the potent mix of Sith alchemical architecture and Sith magic coursing through the ship. Once the Republic could identify the true Sith forces, they were able to focus their attacks and rout the invaders. The Sith then turned all of their efforts to taking over Emperor Teta's space, but eventually, through massive Jedi sacrifices and poison gas attacks, as well as additional Republic allies showing up, the Sith were finally routed completely, forcing them to regroup at Primus Golu with Sadao and his Meditation Sphere. When the Lord of the Sith realized that defeat could not be avoided, he set the Sith fleet to jump back to Korriban, but made sure to leave the Republic a parting gift, making the Sun go supernova. From one war to another, as soon as they returned to Sith space, they were right back in the civil war with Gresh's forces. After a skirmish on Korriban between these two claimants to the title Dark Lord, the battle would move to their fleets, massive amounts of Sith assets destroyed fighting against each other. With Sadao's beleaguered fleets taking the most damage, seeming on the edge of total defeat before he sent a ship to crash into Gresh's flagship. With their military decimated by both the Republic and Sith, Kresh's own men decided to kneel to Sadal and preserve what was left of the Sith Empire. A crucial decision, as Empress Teta had been able to figure out a path through the Daragon Trail, and emerged in Sith space leading a Republic fleet to finish them off. Sadal orchestrated a retreat that brought the enemy in pursuit near multiple star systems, using his dark arts to make the suns go supernova. The Republic fleet was suffering too many losses to pursue, and the Empress decided to call it off, and leave the ragged Sith fleets to die off under their own leadership. Surely an empire that would sacrifice their own star systems would burn out like these supernova. The Great Hyperspace War was over, but the Republic did not forget about this threat. They gradually returned to slowly and systematically dissect the Sith Empire, eventually conquering all of Sith space taking their colonies, their five spiritually significant worlds, and trying to dismantle or cover up the countless talismans and artifacts they discovered, all reeking with dark side energy. It was believed that the Sith species had gone extinct, and that their dark beliefs had died off with them. But while the Jedi studied the relics of the fallen Sith Empire, the survivors were spread throughout the galaxy, and even outside of it, all plotting their return. Some were units that were lost during the war, who became the gods of primitive populations like the Kashiri. Others built their power on Vyun and Thul, while Naga Sadao himself was with the remainder of his forces on a single starship. He decided to put down on the moon Yavin 4, 
where his Masasi would construct enormous temples to be used in dark rituals. There was also still the settlement untuned of pure-blooded Sith, but over all this time their force practices were vastly different from the Sith of Korriban. Known as the Sorcerers of Tun, they pushed into the darkness of the Force in a way unlike Sith or Jedi, allowing them powers of phantasms, transmorgification, and thaumaturgy. On Ambria, a Sith Sorceress made the natives construct a massive black obelisk for her dark rituals, which eventually proved to channel more power than she could handle. The Force energy of souls lost here over millennia all burst through and turned the world into a lifeless desert. Race wars would break out between some Sith populations, namely on Kesh. This lost tribe of Sith pitted human mix versus the so-called Red Sith. Eventually, the full-blooded Sith were made extinct on this world. While many other disparate Sith groups would all come to fall under the rule of one mysterious group that escaped the madness of Sadal and the Republic fleets. To stay alive and untrackable, their fleet made regular hyperspace jumps to randomize coordinates. With this process, they came upon the Chiss Ascendancy in the Unknown Regions. They tried brute force to subjugate the blue-skinned aliens, but the Chiss surprised them by offering to be allies. Roughly 20 years later, the Sith would rediscover their lost world of Droman Kaas, and the Chiss were the very first official allies to the new Sith Empire. By 4400 BBY, Dark Jedi Freedon Nad would seek out the treasures of the lost Sith sorcerers, and he came to Yavin 4, discovering the alchemically altered Masasi slave descendants that worship Naga Sadao as a god. He made his way into the chamber where the once leader of the Sith Empire had entombed his spirit in suspended animation. Nad would become the Sith's apprentice, but once he learned all he could, he fought and destroyed the spirit. And with the holocrons of King Aedas and Darth and Dedu, he founded his own empire. Then 400 years later, Vexar Kun would travel to Yavin 4, also in hopes of discovering the esoteric Sith rituals that had been preserved in the temples. The Masasi swarmed him, destroying his ship and bringing him to the great Sith Temple of Fire to be consumed by the Masasi blood sacrifice ritual. The god that they summoned was an old Sith worm, once created through Sadao's alchemy. When Kun killed the demon, the Masasi saw him as a god, worshipping him and following his orders to construct even more temples to focus the dark side energy here. Kun would practice his alchemy on the Masasi priests, and then created great warrior servants to fight alongside him. He took these to confront Dark Jedi Alima Kito and Nula Keldroma, and when they fought, the ancient Sith amulets they wore had a connection to Mark Aragnos, whose spirit emerged to decide the fight, proclaiming that Exar Kun was the Dark Lord of the Sith and Keldroma the Apprentice. This apprentice would lead a strike against his old Jedi masters on Coruscant, only to be captured and brought before the Senate. Kun would deploy a fleet and thousands of Masasi soldiers to rush into the Senate chamber. In the Sith fleet was an ancient ship used by Sadal, which was using its old trick of setting stars to supernova, drawing Republic fleets to rush to engage them near the Kron Cluster, but this move was ripping apart the Sith fleets as well. After Kun escaped Coruscant, he raided Ossus, and was able to add priceless Jedi artifacts to the vaults of the Sith. From here he would return to Yavin 4, but his apprentice betrayed him. Called back to the light, he gave their position to the Jedi, and when Kun knew that the full might of the Republic was descending on him, he turned to the old rituals to create an immortal spirit that could still dwell in this plane. Some Masasi would be sent off-world to be preserved, but thousands of these servants would be sacrificed in the dark ritual that freed his spirit. Well, the Jedi's creation of a wall of light side energy would work to seal his spirit away in the temple. In the decades that followed, the Masasi that were sent off of Yavin would come to live very diverse lives. Some would use this new freedom to pursue mundane lives, while others fought a life of revenge toward the Sith, realizing that they had been manipulated and alchemically created as a slave race, while some did also survive the ritual on Yavin, and continued to maintain the temples. The Jedi would make contact with the Sorcerers of Tund, cautious at first, but recognizing that these Sith species were not the same in belief. There was one Karnak Tetsu who saw himself as a prophet and wanted to turn them deeper into the dark, but after he was defeated, that was the only issue they ever had with the Jedi Order. The Jedi eventually gave up trying to convert them, and just sent occasional emissaries to check in over the next several thousand years. The Kasai and Masasi castes on Korriban were still in enough abundance to maintain sites, though they had been mostly abandoned over the centuries. Droman Kos was the capital of the Sith Empire, which all this time was still being secretly rebuilt. Ever since the Great Hyperspace War, this Sith Emperor Tenebrae, also known as Darth Vitiate, had used his unparalleled power in the dark side to extend his life over thousands of years. 
slowly building up generations of devotees to his vision of a reborn Sith Empire. But this empire would turn its back on the species that gave them their name. Much of the empire was human, though the Emperor himself and many of the high-ranking positions were those of Sith hybrids. The descendants of those that were created by the mixing of Dark Jedi exiles and the Kasai priests. A bit of propaganda is that these beings were called Sith Purebloods at this time. Circa 4000 BBY, these were far from the original Sith species, and it reflects these beings recognizing that their red skin side was going extinct, not numerous enough to be substantial even in the empire that used its name. Though some believe that this term pureblood represented their belief that this alchemical union between human and Sith helped to purify the offspring's blood, taking out the weaknesses of each species and making it a perfect race. The reborn Sith Empire would take much of the Outer Rim, and launch a galaxy-spanning war on the Republic. 1300 years after the Great Hyperspace War, the Empire emerged to conduct 28 years of brutal invasions that would come to be known as the Great Galactic War, starting in 3681 BBY with the retaking of Korriban. Somewhat symbolic of this change in species control was that this battle would see the Sith descendant Vindican killed by his younger human apprentice Malgus. The war would end with the triumphant sacking of Coruscant, delivering more damage to the cities and Jedi temples than any other force would match in history. The planet was smoldering, and the Supreme Chancellor had been executed by Darth Angrel, forcing the Republic to sign the Treaty of Coruscant. In the Cold War era that followed, the Empire started to allow non-purebloods to train in the Dark Arts on Korriban, bringing up any Force sensitives they found in the Empire, even if they were a slave. This was found to be distasteful to the Overseers on Korriban, but this did help the Empire to keep up with the numbers of the Jedi Order. Over the following millennia, the Purebloods, which were only just hybrids, remember, became further diluted and killed off, leading to a near extinction with no notable communities of them existing. While various creations of these people, from relics to language, were spread across the galaxy, influencing the lives and cultures of countless beings. The greatest legacy would be the word Sith itself, being synonymous with the dark side, and in layman used in everything from an insult, like Sith spit, to a general description of evil, and especially anyone who used supernatural means being described as a Sith, even some Jedi were assumed to be Sith in the Outer Rim. And then of course, the Jedi Order never forgot about the Sith. The new Sith Wars were fought against the Brotherhood of Darkness, which operated a Sith Academy on Korriban which would raise Darth Bane with Bane thinking that the Sith species was long extinct. In the year 45 BBY, some refugees of the Tung species set down on the Sith sorcerer's world of Tund, and when they were chased off, they complained to the Senate, and Palpatine was quick to degrade these strange mystics, warning that these people should be isolated and no travelers go near the world, while Darth Sidious secretly had agents infiltrate their ranks and learn what they could of this strange and unique art. Funny enough, one full-blooded, original Sith species from Tund made his way to Coruscant, where he got by using his knowledge to create magic shows in the Coco District Theater. This may have inadvertently preserved the species, as all of the sorcerers of Tund were burned away by the green fire of an electromagnetic torpedo, fired by the Force-sensitive Rokar Gepta, who was training with them until he learned all of their secrets, for dubbing himself the Sorcerer of Tund putting an end to this outpost colony of Sith exiles that had lasted for thousands of years. There was one last ray of hope that shot out across time itself, when 41 years after the Battle of Yavin, a ship named the Harbinger popped out of hyperspace, some 5,000 years after it entered the Blue Void. The ship's hyperdrive was damaged by a Jedi's attack during the Great Hyperspace War, and had a payload of ore that was to help with Naga Sadal's attack on the core. It was commanded by Seis Rogan, a Kalish who was leading a platoon of Masasi warriors. Perhaps they could have revived this subspecies of the Sith, but Jedi Knight Jaden Kor was able to board the ship, kill the captain, and use the volatile ore to destroy the ship and have it explode on a nearby moon, killing everyone on board. The Sith's impact on the galaxy was the greatest of any single species, rivaled perhaps only by the humans. We must assume that somewhere amongst the stars there was some outpost of Sith beings because as history shows, they have proven to appear out of the darkness countless times when others believe them vanquished from the galaxy, always finding a way to return, much like the infamous Sith Order itself. So that's it for the Sith species, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. There are tons of references to real world concepts around evil and the devil, the most obvious being the red skin, but also things like them being left handed as a reference to biblical lines showing a preference for the right hand of God and curses for the left. 
The fact that the Yavin temples channel dark side energy is a reference to Christian accounts of Mayan temples, and real world Yavin is Tikal in Guatemala. There are also a lot of human sacrifices within Mayan culture, just like with the Masasi Sith, tons of depictions of which can be found at Tikal. Many believe that there are real world equivalents to the magics and alchemical creations, just like the Sith, and this is a perfect time to give a warning from a Sith practitioner and real world most interesting man, Christopher Lee, who did have a deep interest in the occult. Have met people who claimed to be Satanists, who claimed to be involved with black magic, who claimed that they not only knew a lot about it, but as I said, I've certainly never been involved and I warn all of you, never, never, never. You will not only lose your mind, you lose your soul. Extra details come from the Complete Encyclopedia, Old Republic Encyclopedia, Essential Guide to Warfare, and Atlas, and then a ton of different novels. If you made it this far, please help out by hitting that like button and leaving a comment. Let me know if you learned anything new, add something I might have missed, and make a suggestion for future videos. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss videos like this. Check out the description below for links to cool Star Wars metal print arts and free Audible audiobooks, as well as our Patreon and PayPal. Especially our $25 tier supporters, Chris Garcia, Cass Costello, C7Go, Matthew Beltrami, Seraph Diaz, and Bill Payne. But most important of all, remember, whether it's the endless wars and backstabbing, experimenting on and sacrificing your own, trusting the wrong outsiders, or blowing up your own stars, nobody's as good at destroying the Sith as the Sith. And the Force will be with you, always.